The oceans have interested and fascinated people across the globe for millennia. Most everyone understands that the ocean serves as navigation routes and provides a food source, but it's also important to know that the ocean plays a role in climate, both global and regional climate. A thousand years ago, nobody understood why the tides ebbed and flowed or why the seas were salty. Today, we've got answers to those questions, but a host of other questions remain, particularly when we start thinking about how the ocean will respond to and contribute to climate change. Now, those questions are focused on the ocean, but behind all those questions is really a desire to understand how the ocean will impact our lives and our livelihoods and how a changing ocean will affect all of us. My current research is focused on what's called the global ocean overturning circulation. So at high latitudes in the polar regions, the surface waters during the winter time get very cold. And because of that, they're heavier than the waters underneath it, and they sink. And when they sink, they carry with it their properties at the surface, the heat, the carbon dioxide, and their salinity. And those waters then sink and they spread to distant parts of the globe. And that means then that other waters, the surface waters, have to return to those high latitudes and they bring with them warmth. And why it's particularly interesting right now is that we know that since the Industrial Revolution, 35% of the carbon dioxide that's been released is now stored in the ocean. And it's stored in the ocean because the overturning circulation has taken it from the surface to depth and then spread it to the deep ocean. But there's big questions that remain. We want to know, well, if the overturning changes as time goes on, how will that impact the ocean's ability to be a reservoir for this carbon dioxide? And the fact that the ocean is a reservoir for carbon dioxide is good news because that means the carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere warming. But it's also bad news for the ocean because it leads to ocean acidification. A few years ago, a number of oceanographers across the globe, in fact from seven different countries, came together and designed an ocean observing system. And this ocean observing system is a system of ocean instrumentation that's in place from the coast of Labrador all the way across the North Atlantic to the Scottish Shelf. And these instruments that are arranged from the ocean surface all the way to the deep part of the ocean are continuously measuring ocean currents, ocean temperature, and ocean salinity. And all of that data that we gather gives us a measure of the overturning circulation and helps us learn more about the mechanisms that are driving that overturning circulation. So my work is really focused on trying to understand how the physics of the ocean, the overturning, will change in the years and decades ahead so that others understand how that will impact ocean ecosystems, climate, and ultimately ocean fisheries. We study microbes in the ocean, which are small, single-celled organisms, and primarily we focus on algae, or phytoplankton, and these are also another type of microbe, and they're essentially single-celled plants, and so they are photosynthetic organisms that form the base of the food web, or essentially providing all the food and energy for the, the ocean and ecosystem. And, and so everything that's larger, fish, dolphins, whales, they're ultimately getting their food from these single cell plants or algae. We've known from past research that the oceans are becoming more acidic because of increased carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. And so this has two major effects. One is that there are shelled organisms that are particularly sensitive to this increased acidity. So things like shrimp, oysters, scallops, um, also corals, they have these hard shells and so that acid just dissolves those shells. The other factor to, to understand is that long-term increases in carbon dioxide um, that enters the ocean and, and there's other organisms that use that too and, and those are the algae or, or phytoplankton, the microbes. Some may enjoy that, that additional CO2, they may flourish, but, um, but others may not like it, that, that additional CO2 uh, may harm them. What our studies have recently shown is that uh, we see short-term pulses in acidity that can affect microbes, including algae, and potentially with cascading effects on the larger ecosystem. I'm an environmental economist and my work is on the economics of the oceans. A lot of what I do is study uh, fisheries 
and um, the contributions of fisheries to um, food security in, in the global uh, environment. So it used to be that virtually all the seafood that people ate came from wild caught uh, fisheries. And over time, we started uh, reaching the absolute limits of what the oceans could produce for us. Some of that was we were literally overfishing fisheries and so we couldn't catch as much as we used to, but even in well-managed fisheries, there are limits to what we can catch. And so in the last 30 years, what has come from wild-caught fisheries has really flattened out. And so all the new seafood that we're eating is coming from uh, farmed fish. How will this unfold into the future as the world's population continues to grow and the demand for healthy protein from seafood continues to grow? How will we continue to grow fish farming over time? So a lot of the work that I've been doing recently has been trying to address some of the bottlenecks in that system. Marine conservation often starts with a fairly simple and well-intentioned prescription, uh, but those prescriptions can lead to really uh, serious unintended consequences uh, if you don't think about the social science and the economic angles. A perfect example was first attempts to address over, overfishing. The simple prescription was, well, let's just set a quota and the industry-wide quota will stop people from overfishing. So that triggered this mad race to fish. People started building bigger boats, faster boats, catching the fish sooner, and then that caused the regulator to shorten the season and on went this vicious cycle. That unintended consequence was a direct result of not thinking through the way the social science uh, can inform the best policy. When we study a problem like fisheries and economics or a problem like coastal climate adaptation, we're already studying an interaction between humans and the environment. When we talk about unintended consequences of leaving out the social science, there's another set of unintended consequences of leaving out the natural science. If we don't understand the way the natural systems work, we can never really understand how these policies to deal with overfishing or to deal with climate adaptation on the coast will perform. Understanding the basic science of the oceans in what Zachary and Susan do is extremely important. We have to understand the basic physical and biological oceanography because that's the basis of the marine productivity that ultimately gives rise to the fisheries that I'm studying in much of my work. Isaac Newton figured out the tides all by himself. Today, here at the Nicholas School, we are a community of scholars and learners focused on understanding how the environment and the complexity of its changes impact our lives and livelihoods. Our strength is our ability to work together on that arc from discovery to solutions.